Hello, my name is Christina Kokoris. I'm a writer and researcher, and I'm joined today by Claire Freestone, who is the curator of photographs at the National Portrait Gallery. Today we're going to be talking about a very special photographer, Madame Yovande, and Claire has just curated a wonderful exhibition titled Yovande, Life and Color, which is on view now at the National Portrait Gallery. So we'll be talking about her work today. So before we get into her life and work, I think it's important that we situate ourselves in the time period. Mm -hmm. So I think we're gonna go back to the 1910s, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. to say we're going to talk about the suffragettes. Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about the ways that photography was used by the suffragettes? Yvonne herself was a suffragette, actually. So she joined the Women's Social and Political Union. Um, and so she would have very much understood the ways that the suffragettes were using portraiture to actually sort of reinstate the authority and um, status of these women that in the press had been portrayed as troublemakers, mm -hmm. as sort of scuffling kind of women, uh, working women. Um, so. Um, Lena Connell actually was a photographer that was doing just that um, and that was the photographer that Yvonne went to see and really set her on the path uh, to taking up photography. But she didn't end up working with her long term, right? No, she went to see her that afternoon. Uh, she answered the advert and she went along to her studio and she saw what she uh, described as the tall, grave woman um, surrounded by all the images of her heroines, you know, Emmeline Pankhurst, Christabel, um, you know, all these women. And um, uh, basically, she, it was practical reasons she didn't take up with Lena Connell. It was just too far for her to travel <laughs> at the time. But she did realize that she wanted to have a woman as her tutor. And she said fortuitously, that was, uh, you know, the foremost photographer of the day was Lally Charles. Right, so she works with Lally Charles, mm. but only for a year, if I remember correctly. I think she almost completes her three-year apprenticeship, but ah, not okay. quite, not quite. <laughs> so, um, yeah, she, I mean, I have to get my years right, but she, she does um, go through all the, the whole apprenticeship, which um, involves being at the works, both where they do the retouching. Um, there's a lot of retouching in those days, but whatever we think about retouching <laughs> now. Um, and, you know, how to finish and mount a photograph. Um, she also walks the dog a lot, I think, <laughs> but she says, you know, really, I, I actually left having taken one photograph, but I learned a lot about the ways of the world. So I think it was about how to work with people, how to run a photographic studio. Yeah, and then when she sets off on her own, I guess we should say we're actually sitting quite close by to where her first studio was. Exactly. So, yeah, in 1914, her father gives her a sum of money to set up her very first studio, and that is at 92 Victoria Street, just down the road. And um, what's amazing about um, that building is that it's shared uh, by lots of women's organizations. So the Women's Institute is there, and that had been founded in the 1890s, um, but it was a real sort of feminist organization. Yeah. It's not the Women's Institute as we know it today, but um, it must have been a deliberate choice actually to have her studio there. Yeah. Mm. What strikes me yeah. about Yvonne is when she goes out on her own, she really seemed to have a mind already for how to market herself. Even the very fact that she established herself under a mononym, mm -hmm. it was her real name. Yeah, yeah. But it was not common at the time for a woman or an artist to just go by a single name, correct? Mm. Yes, yeah. I mean, that's something that we have sort of re-established for the exhibition, actually, because, um, I mean, we do know her as Madame Yvonne as well, and mm. that's not incorrect. She certainly used that on her copyright stamps, um, and it was a form of address that sort of gave her a professional status, I suppose. Um, but definitely everything she signed, um, you know, everywhere that her work was published in those days, it was just Yvonne, and she signs, you know, her autobiography is published as Yvonne, um, and also outside her studio, we've seen, you know, the display box and it just says Yvonne. So we feel quite confident that was her intention where she had autonomy. Such a brilliant name. You know, it why really not is. It? Yeah. 
it does have a slightly exotic sense mm. to it as well, mm. which I think really adds to her work when you're looking at it. Yeah. yeah. So I know we're going forward a little bit, but I think we should talk about her goddesses series. Mm. I think for anybody that's familiar with her work, this is the series that they know. Mm. So she's photographed all of these society women dressed as figures from classical mythology. How did she have access to women like that? And how did she get them to agree to be photographed in this way? It was building on her career, really. So this is 1935, and she's moved into the heart of Mayfair. She's now got her Berkeley Square studio and launched herself as a colour portraitist, mm -hmm. um, but also as a, um, a colour artist. She knew these women through having photographed them very regularly for the illustrated press. And in a way, that's how her career grew through the years previous. So right from 1916, when she had her first photograph published in the sketch, you know, every week they would appear in the sketch, the Tatler, the Bystander, some appeared in Vogue, um, Country Life, and her work was disseminated and she would have built up these connections um, for instance, with um, you know the Mitfords or the Duchess of Argyle, um, who were some of these goddesses, um, but also she took inspiration from a ball that happened in March of 1935. So at that time, there'd be a lot of these charity balls, um, and people enjoyed dressing up. Um, so she obviously, you know, saw this had happened. She invited some of the women that had been to that ball, um, but then took it, obviously, to the next level. I remember reading about that ball, that it had been described as a galaxy of goddesses, mm. which is so yeah. fantastic. I think all of the pictures in that series are really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in one aspect, which we should talk about as well, is how vibrant all of her work still is today, despite mm -hmm. being almost 100 years old. But in looking at them, one really stands out to me, which is the portrait of Lady Campbell, mm -hmm. um, who is posed as Niobe, mm -hmm. who is the goddess who, or I guess not a goddess, but she cries for the deaths of all of her children. Yeah. And the reason that this one stands out for me is because it's framed so tightly mm -hmm. into her face that it really is separate from all these other portraits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense of agony that comes through with the tears coming down. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that there may have been some influence by Man Ray in his mm -hmm. photograph with all of the tears. Yeah. Was she very influenced by the Surrealists? Yes, yeah, I mean, I think we have pretty strong evidence for that now. Um, I know we talked earlier about the um, the international exhibition, a surrealist exhibition coming to uh, the center of London in 1936. Obviously, that's a year after this series. <laughs> um, Man Ray would have published um, his photographs earlier. She, she definitely references Man Ray in her autobiography when she's talking about nudes. So she's well aware of his photographs at this time. Um, and also we know that she, she photographed Edward James in 1933 and he was a surrealist patron. Um, I think she was his friend. She, she rented a house on his estate for a while. So um, there's sort of strong evidence that her life interacted with these people, but also it's just obvious through you know, through what we see, especially the goddesses and the still life, I think, as well. Um, you know, the lobster actually is years before uh, Dali's uh, lobster telephone, for instance, but slightly after Man Ray photographs a lobster on a mannequin. Right. Um, so, yes, I think definitely. And, and um, that photograph that you mentioned of Niobe is incredibly powerful and she talks in her autobiography about um, inviting her cousin's wife along actually so um, Dolly Campbell was the wife of uh, Malcolm Campbell who was her cousin who had just won the land speed record and um, so obviously she pulled in some favors as well <laughs> and she used glycerine to sort of mimic these tears and you know glycerine this was the makeup of Hollywood as well and there's something about the cropping of that, that you could definitely sort of reference a cinema screen and the technicolor that would soon be very dominant. Um, so I think uh, she, she, you know, she's brilliant at giving these accounts and she talks about poor Dolly getting 
uh, the glycerin mixed with her actual mascara and crying real tears of <laughs> sorrow and pain. And she said, I rushed, rushed the focus to get this really tight crop. So she knew even then, you know, that that was something she wanted, this, this um, picture of the utmost misery and pain, she says. Yeah, well, that's what made it so convincing then. <laughs> Just, yeah. But I think your, her intention was to get that right from the beginning, yeah. <laughs> what was the reception like at the time when people saw these photographs? I mean, there's, there's a, accounts that are really positive in the press, actually. Uh, so I think the Times reviewed it. We know that some of the sitters went along to an opening party. Um, and I think, uh, you know, she had a great deal of success in colour in the late 30s, um, you know, both in the commercial and artistic spheres. So, yeah, definitely it was, it was a huge success. But I would still say that the photographic establishment at that time probably felt uh, that it was, you, you know, colour was still on the periphery. Um, it wasn't sort of the, the serious medium of photography. We should talk about mm. this. Colour photography, it's mm. always shocked me that first, the first colour photograph, I believe, is dated to 1861. Mm -hmm. And then we have this really long gap in history before anyone was really regularly doing colour photographs. And then even after that, it still took decades for very so-called serious photographers to adopt colour. Mm -hmm. Why was there such a negative perception towards colour? I mean, I think certainly in the 30s, um, it was really used predominantly by advertising. And I think it gave it sort of a bad reputation because that was the commercial world, which was sort of the antithesis of the, um, you know, the absolute opposite of, of the art world, really. But, um, and also it was thought to be sort of garish and unnatural, uh, whereas, of course, Vivex uh, proclaimed, you know, in its advertising to, to uh, reproduce real natural colours. Um, so it is, it is a sort of mystery to us now, actually. It does feel strange that it took so many years for the acceptance of colour. One of my favourite anecdotes shared by William Eggleston, who was a big colour photographer, mm -hmm. was that at some party, uh, Cartier-Bresson came up to him and said, colour is bullshit. Mm -hmm. And um, it partly makes me laugh because we now know that Cartier-Bresson also photographed in color, but he would often destroy the color negatives afterwards. So mm -hmm. color became this dirty little secret mm -hmm. among photographers, which again, yeah. from a modern lens, is so shocking to us now. But um, tell me more about the Vivex printing process because mm -hmm. this is something that she really used and not a lot of people are familiar with. Yeah, so in 1930, uh, she came across this process through actually a commercial worker. Um, and um, so it's a pretty complicated process to an, us now, but it actually was offered through Colour Photographs Limited as the first sort of standardised laboratory practice, really, where photographers could send their negatives. So they didn't have to and make the prints themselves like Paul Outerbridge was doing potentially. So it's a sort of different kind of way of working with this process. Um, so basically this process involved the development both of an apparatus to take three separation negatives and also a way to make really fantastic prints. So they, the, um, you know, development was needed in both of these directions. So she actually in the exhibition, we have this amazing repeating back that she fixed onto the back of her studio camera. And this would move three quarter plate glass negatives along automatically at a fraction of a second. So one would be exposed for yellow, another for red, and another for blue. And then these would be sent, you know, properly exposed through following this process to the lab and then printed um, with this process that used the carbro method, which was a mixture of carbon and bromide printing. Um, so it's sort of a mixture of printmaking and photography, really. And so they were printed and superimposed with pigments in these three colours and then built up to a full positive 
image. Um, but the great thing about Vivex was that, um, you know, Douglas Spencer and his colleagues had um, manipulated the Carbro process really to introduce this cellophane film that would allow for sort of perfect registration. She's got this one shot camera and this enabled her to expose the three negatives all at once. So when she went out of the studio very occasionally, or it gave more freedom, so the, the exposure time was lessened, basically. Is this process why these pictures today look so vibrant? Because to the perhaps uneducated viewer, looking at these pictures, they almost feel anachronistic. They don't feel like they were made 100 years ago. How are they still so vibrant? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, because these are pigments that sort of built up a sort of physical object, really, where they're built up in layers. And when you look at the process, you can see it's sort of very, it's three-dimensional, actually. Everything she did to move them from something which could be technically perfect, but actually rather boring. So she, you know, she spoke avidly for um, the use of colour photography um, to be, to, for it to be taken seriously and to, for imagination to be foregrounded really. So um, she said, you know, obviously her famous dictum, be original or die, <laughs> and also, you know, let's have a riot of colour. So she would throw... And bring life and colour into uh, their work. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> which is you know, where the exhibition title comes from. So she, she really advocated the use mm -hmm. of um, bringing your own personality to bear on a photograph. And she would experiment with different fabrics using de different depths of fields, sort of really throwing things out of focus, using yeah, new synthetic fabrics and putting filters over the lenses. So, you know, the printers that were after this technically perfect uh, negatives, they would be like, what have you done? You know, what have you done? She said, you know, don't worry, just print. I want this watery effect or I want it to have this blue sort of historical feel. Mm. Yeah, yeah, she really seemed to love um, to experiment as much as possible. There's one image that really fascinates me that is an inverted negative, I believe. Mm. It's Joan Maud, her, her actual likeness is a negative, but it's all colorful behind her. Yeah, Can you tell yeah. me more about this picture? So I think what's happened there is that um, a, a different negative has been used using for a different pigment, so the in incorrect really, but they've, it's obviously, she's instructed the printers to to do this, um, we've got, well, there are one or two other examples where it kind of looks almost solarized to us, but right. I think it's through the printing that it's created this sort of inverted, uh, you know, off key sort of um, image, but obviously it's fascinating to us. And um, I think throughout her career, she clearly loved experimenting. So, you know, she took up solarization in the right. 60s, um, you know, obviously 30 years after Marie and Lee Miller had done this, but... But around but, the time that also Richard Avedon was doing solarization. True, this is, uh, that's, yeah, but, and I think, you know, she, she just wanted to keep in reinventing herself and her work and um, bringing sort of new life to things, really. There's one picture in the exhibition that also stands out to me as a little bit separate from the rest. Mm. And this is a part of a series that I believe she was commissioned to do of the, mm. um, the construction of the RMS Queen Mary. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture that really reminds me a lot of Stieglitz's photo, The Steerage. Mm -hmm. Now for anybody that has to study art history and specifically studying the history of photography, this image is shown and we're mm -hmm. told that this is one of the great works of photography. This is the establishment of modernism within photography. And looking at Yvonne's picture of, I believe it's the funnel, mm -hmm. it has these same geometric lines. Mm -hmm. The only true difference is that this is in color, mm -hmm. whereas Stieglitz's, of course, is in black and white. And I wonder, looking at that picture, why someone like Stieglitz's pictures held up as being mm -hmm. the thing that changed photography and Yvonne's is sort of fallen by the wayside. Mm -hmm. It gets to the question which there's no good answer to, mm -hmm. which is why are some artists held up as pioneers and you know, change makers and others mm -hmm. completely fall behind? Why didn't she get this kind of recognition in her mm -hmm. life or after? No, that's, I mean, that's a brilliant comparison. I love that. I think, um, 
you know, I really can see formally that it's very, very similar. And I, I think, um, you know, a photographer visited the exhibition last week and was looking at it very much in those formal ways. And uh, she is brilliant at composition, actually. Uh, you know, there's clearly these little elements where she's composing in color as well quite often. So she'll bring, you know, the tip of a pen or a red flower or something just to balance out a background. Or, and it's really, you know, she did say, you cannot expect to compose a photograph in the same way in color as black and white. You need to rethink everything. And, and there was no old masters in that. You had to really sort of in, invent yourself or maybe look back at painting. But I think, you know, what, why is she not better known? Um, I think, you know, it could be several reasons, really. Obviously, the history of photography has, you know, until the last few decades been fairly patriarchal, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, you know, Julia Margaret Cameron is one of the photographers that right. makes it into the books. But, um, and Yvonne definitely referenced and, and championed Cameron. Um, but also, I think, because uh, Yvonne was a studio photographer, she had to run a business, really. She, it, was her, it was her way of earning a living, and that was really important to who she was. Um, so as she was a jobbing photographer, and that was often the realm of, of women in photography. They, they were studio photographers, and maybe the status of them, you know, is not quite held up in the same way as sort of more experimental pioneers. Um, and also her archive that we, have, we acquired in 2021, which is really amazing. So 2,000 of these separation plates um, that we've had money from Chanel Culture Fund to uh, digitize and to include some in the exhibition. Um, I think just that that archive was in private hands until recently. So I suppose, you know, we didn't know about her whole practice until fairly recently. And now it's a chance to really reevaluate it. And resurrect her in some yes. ways. Yes, of course. Yeah. When you look at the landscape of photography today, do you mm -hmm. see any clear influence of her work permeating current photographers? We've talked mm -hmm. before about a picture of John Galliano that seems mm -hmm. to very clearly reference her photograph mm -hmm. of Vivian Leigh. Mm -hmm. Have you seen anything else that reminds mm -hmm. you of her work? I mean, there have been actual uh, sort of um, comparison, uh, sightings um, and citations, and that's been, yeah, uh, Mario Tistino has definitely, you know, he did this uh, shoot for Vogue that clearly referenced Yvonne. Um, I think Miles Aldridge, um, definitely there's been a number of photographers in the 90s, I, I think, use that sort of heightened color sense and potential sort of kitsch in a way that, that you think could definitely have been drawn, uh, you know, Yvonne's, uh, drawn upon Yvonne's influence. Cindy Sherman, you know, I think <laughs> yeah, that absolutely. definitely that, that has been uh, compared to, in, you know, in academic papers and things. Um, but I, I think a lot of colour work in the 90s, when they were really pushing, you know, pushing colour and, and sort of making it really vibrant, I think, um, and uh, really interesting photographer Nita Man Madahar um, made this series uh, called Flora that actually directly referenced the Goddess series. Um, and she call, entitled each photograph by the sitter, sitter's first name, and they were her friends because she said, um, you know, a lot of the women in Yvonne's Goddess series were hiding behind their husband's names, <laughs> which was the case in the 30s. Of sure. Them. So, um, yeah, I think there have been many direct references and John Galliano himself did a, um, you know, a, a season which directly referenced Yvonne's work. Um, and he said, you know, for many reasons, I think he was inspired, but he was born in Streatham and so was she. Ah, okay. <laughs> so it's quite a nice, nice connection there. Nice connection, yeah. There was a moment in her career where she was shooting in black and white, mm. partly because after the war, the availability, I assume, of pigments and color photographs um, were not as available. Mm. So what do you think about that period in her life and those photographs? Yeah, so actually, yeah, 1939 was a really tragic year for Yvonne because her 
husband died and the colour photographs uh, actually closed because a lot of the men that were working there went off to war. Um, and of course, the Second World War started. Right. And so she makes this amazing still life called Crisis, which appears as an allegory to war with the sort of petals scattered, um, like sort of fallen bodies, really, because she lived through the First World War. So she was really, um, you know, aware of how terrible this could be. Um, but she keeps operating throughout the Second World War. Um, she has a studio in Farnham and she keeps her Berkeley Square studio. And then after the war, um, she actually partners with Morris Broomfield for a, a few years. And he was a young male photographer who was very good at sort of, um, you know, commercial um, photography and work in factories and really sort of beautiful compositions. And he could bring different skills. So she. I think she was a people person. She really liked partnering up. So they obviously formed a, a really successful and, um, you know, friendship and a business uh, for a number of years. And we see in her work that she goes out of the studio. She tries, you know, environmental portraiture and she's also making montages, uh, quite sort of quirky montages with her cat and other sitters. <laughs> so I think she's... She's really trying different things, but obviously it's sad. She doesn't take up Kodachrome or, you know, new C-type technologies when they come along in a big way. Um, there are some colour covers for Tatler magazine in the 50s, but uh, definitely the majority of her work is in black and white, which right. may, may seem strange. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think she didn't take those up? I mean, it's, it is strange, isn't it? I think, I mean, it took a while for colour photography to get going again, weirdly, even though Kodachrome was available from the late 30s, but the Second World War put a big sort of uh, hiatus um, for that. But I think, um, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think maybe she, she was, a, a, you know, she was moving through her life and maybe she couldn't recreate that real pop of colour that the magic of those the magic, other maybe. prints. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think possibly it's that. So mm. when you approach curating an exhibition like mm. this, which will undoubtedly be an introduction for so many people mm. to her work, where do you begin? Because if you have this entire archive at your disposal, mm. how do you select from that? What is it that you want to show? And was there anything surprising that you found? Uh, so it was quite a long process. Um, obviously, COVID came right in the middle of it. So <laughs> that put a pause for a little while. Um, so, I mean, I began by looking at all previous scholarship, obviously. And, you know, even though she's little known, there are some real champions and some real experts. And so I wanted to consult them. And it was great in the, you know, catalogue to, to bring some on board. So we have um, Pam Roberts, who curated the 1990 exhibition with Robin Gibson. So, you know, we started looking at those sources and at primary research, like her autobiography, including an unpublished autobiography and mm. some of her talks and lectures that she gave. So there's a lot of um, original material, which is great. Um, and then we also have at the gallery a lot of her exhibition prints that she left us, that she left uh, to Roy Strong before she died um, in the early 70s, she left them. Uh, so we knew we wanted original Vivex prints where they existed. And we wanted to include the works that are really held up and celebrated. And then, of course, this vast archive that we went through, we, um, so I was really just photographing these separation negatives on my phone in black and white and inverting them to see what they might look like <laughs> in sort of positive black and white, but then trying to imagine how they might look like in color. Right. Um, but because the digitization process fed off us actually commissioning a printer and looking at historical prints, um, uh, historical pigments, you know, it was a sort of back to front process. So we didn't have everything at our fingertips in order to make the selection. Um, so it was, you know, um, it was not 
uh, sort of, you know, a one-way process. We were doing this in many different ways and obviously looking at negative packets for names. Like, you know, we saw Edward James and, you know, that turns out to be Edward James, the surrealist patron, and that was an image that appeared on his book of poetry, but uncredited. Um, and a lot of her work for women's magazines, you know, that we... So having the negative packets, we knew what they were. And then going to the British Library and looking through these magazines and, you know, seeing how they were published at the time. Yeah. So it was... Uh, yeah, it's sort of, I think we wanted to tell a rounded story, obviously focusing on her colour work in the 30s, um, think, looking at how she brought an artistic vision even on her commercial practice, really. I love that you've also included a lot of these self-portraits that mm -hmm. she's done. It adds a bit of a personal touch to it. Yeah. There's one in particular I love that feels almost Duchampian to me. Mm -hmm. She's got this frame hanging around her. She's also holding negatives, and then there's all of these, you know, color pigments and other things scattered yeah. around. It's a really fantastic mm -hmm. image and feels like she was inspired by something. I mean, you're, pro you're probably right. It's, um, it's very self-referential, isn't it? <laughs> She's put herself in the frame. And it's actually one of the very last photographs in colour that she takes wow. in 1940. And um, I think she really is uh, sort of putting herself as an artist in the picture and saying, uh, you know, this, she, she includes the photograph of Hecate, who's the moon goddess and the goddess of night and magic. And I think all the sort of, um, all her chemicals and the tricks of her trade, she's really saying, you know, this is the magic of photography. This has been my craft and I'm an artist. I'm, I'm sure that's what she's saying. Yeah, yeah. she absolutely <laughs> was. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks.